Chapter Six of An Old Fashioned Girl. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. An Old Fashioned Girl by Louisa May Alcott. Chapter Six. Grandma. Where's Polly? asked Fan one snowy afternoon, as she came into the dining-room where Tom was reposing on the sofa, with his boots in the air, absorbed in one of those delightful books, in which boys are cast away on desert islands, where every known fruit, vegetable, and flower is in its prime all the year round, or lost in boundless forests, where the young heroes have thrilling adventures, kill impossible beasts, and— when the author's invention gives out, suddenly find their way home, laden with tiger skins, tame buffaloes, and other pleasing trophies of their prowess. Dunno, was Tom's brief reply, for he was just escaping from an alligator of the largest size. Do put down that stupid book and let's do something, said Fanny, after a listless stroll round the room. Hi, they've got him was the only answer vouchsafed by the absorbed reader. "'Where's Polly?' asked Maud, joining the party with her hands full of paper dolls all suffering for ball dresses. "'Do get along and don't bother me,' cried Tom, exasperated at the interruption. "'Then tell us where she is. I'm sure you know, for she was down here a little while ago,' said Fanny. "'Up in Grandma's room, maybe.' "'Provoking thing. You knew it all the time and didn't tell.' just to plague us scolded maud but tom was now under water stabbing his alligator and took no notice of the indignant departure of the young ladies polly's always poking up in grandma's room i don't see what fun there is in it said fanny as they went upstairs polly's a very queer girl and grandma pets her a great deal more than she does me observed maud with an injured air let's peek and see what they are doing whispered fan pausing at the half-open door grandma was sitting before a quaint old cabinet the doors of which stood wide open showing glimpses of the faded relics treasured there on a stool at the old lady's feet sat polly looking up with intent face and eager eyes quite absorbed in the history of a high-heeled brocade shoe which lay in her lap well my dear grandma was saying she had it on the very day that uncle joe came in as she sat at work and said dolly we must be married at once very well joe says aunt dolly and down she went to the parlour where the minister was waiting never stopping to change the dimity dress she wore and was actually married with her scissors and pinball at her side and her thimble on that was in war times eighteen twelve my dear and uncle joe was in the army so he had to go and he took that very little pinball with him here it is with the mark of a bullet through it for he always said his dolly's cushion saved his life how interesting that is cried polly as she examined the faded cushion with the hole in it why grandma you never told me that story said fanny hurrying in finding the prospect was a pleasant one for a stormy afternoon you never asked me to tell you anything my dear so i kept my old stories to myself answered grandma quietly tell some now please may we stay and see the funny things said fan and maud eyeing the open cabinet with interest if polly likes she is my company and i am trying to entertain her for i love to have her come said grandma with her old-time politeness oh yes do let them stay and hear the stories i've often told them what good times we have up here and teased them to come but they think it's too quiet now sit down girls and let grandma go on you see i pick out something in the cabinet that looks interesting and then she tells me about it said polly eager to include the girls in her pleasures and glad to get them interested in grandma's reminiscences for polly knew how happy it made the lonely old lady to live over her past and to have the children round her here are three drawers that have not been opened yet 
each take one and choose something from it for me to tell about said madam quite excited at the unusual interest in her treasures so the girls each opened a drawer and turned over the contents till they found something they wanted to know about Maud was ready first, and holding up an oddly shaped linen bag with a big blue F embroidered on it, demanded her story. Grandma smiled as she smoothed the old thing tenderly and began her story with evident pleasure. My sister Nellie and I went to visit an aunt of ours when we were little girls, but we didn't have a very good time, for she was extremely strict one afternoon when she had gone out to tea and old debbie the maid was asleep in her room we sat on the doorstep feeling homesick and ready for anything to amuse us what shall we do said nelly just as she spoke a ripe plum dropped bounce on the grass before us as if answering her question it was all the plum's fault for if it hadn't fallen at that minute i never should have had the thought which popped into my mischievous mind let's have as many as we want and plague aunt betsy to pay her for being so cross i said giving nelly half the great purple plum it would be dreadful naughty began nelly but i guess we will she added as the sweet mouthful slipped down her throat debbie's asleep come on then and help me shake i said getting up eager for the fun we shook and shook till we got red in the face but not one dropped for the tree was large and our little arms were not strong enough to stir the boughs then we threw stones but only one green and one half-ripe one came down, and my last stone broke the shed window, so there was an end of that. It's as provoking as Aunt Betsy herself, said Nellie, as we sat down out of breath. I wish the wind would come and blow them down for us, panted I, staring up at the plums with longing eyes. If wishing would do any good, I should wish him in my lap at once, added Nellie. You might as well wish him in your mouth and have done with it if you are too lazy to pick them up. If the ladder wasn't too heavy, we could try that, said I, determined to have them. You know we can't stir it, so what is the use of talking about it? you proposed getting the plums now let's see you do it answered nelly rather crossly for she had bitten the green plum and it puckered her mouth wait a minute and you will see me do it cried i as a new thought came into my naughty head what are you taking your shoes and socks off for you can't climb the tree fan don't ask questions but be ready to pick em up when they fall miss lazybones with this mysterious speech i pattered into the house barefooted and full of my plan upstairs i went to a window opening on the shed roof out i got and creeping carefully along till i came near the tree i stood up and suddenly crowed like the little rooster. Nelly looked up and stared and laughed and clapped her hands when she saw what I was going to do. I'm afraid you'll slip and get hurt. Don't care if I do. I'll have those plums if I break my neck doing it. And half sliding, half walking, I went down the sloping roof till the boughs of the tree were within my reach. Hurrah! cried Nellie, dancing down below, as my first shake sent a dozen plums rattling round her. Hurrah! cried I, letting go one branch and trying to reach another. But as I did so, my foot slipped, 
I tried to catch something to hold by, but found nothing, and with a cry down I fell, like a very big plum, on the grass below. Fortunately the shed was low, the grass was thick, and the tree broke my fall. But I got a bad bump, and a terrible shaking. Nellie thought I was killed, and began to cry with her mouth full. But I picked myself up in a minute, for I was used to such tumbles, and didn't mind the pain half as much as the loss of the plums. Hush! Debbie will hear, and spoil all the fun. I said I'd get em, and I have. See what lots have come down with me. So there had, for my fall shook the tree almost as much as it did me and the green and purple fruit lay all about us. By the time the bump on my forehead had swelled as big as a nut, our aprons were half full, and we sat down to enjoy ourselves. But we didn't, oh dear no, for many of the plums were not ripe. Some were hurt by the birds, some crushed in falling, and many as hard as stones. Nellie got stung by a wasp, my head began to ache, and we sat looking at one another rather dismally, when Nellie had a bright idea. Let's cook em, then they'll be good, and we can put some away in our little pails for tomorrow. That will be splendid, there's a fire in the kitchen, Debbie always leaves the kettle on, and we can use her saucepan. And I know where the sugar is, and we'll have a grand time. In we went, and fell to work very quietly. It was a large open fireplace, with the coals nicely covered up, and the big kettle simmering on the hook. We raked open the fire, put on the saucepan, and in it the best of our plums, with water enough to spoil them. But we didn't know that, and felt very important, as we sat waiting for it to boil, each armed with a big spoon, while the sugar-box stood between us, ready to be used. How slow they were, to be sure! I never knew such obstinate things, for they wouldn't soften, though they danced about in the boiling water, and bobbed against the cover, as if they were doing their best. The sun began to get low. We were afraid Debbie would come down, and still those dreadful plums wouldn't look like sauce. At last they began to burst. The water got a lovely purple. We put lots of sugar in, and kept tasting till our aprons and faces were red, and our lips burnt with the hot spoons. There's too much juice, said Nellie, shaking her head wisely. It ought to be thick and nice like Mamma's. I'll pour off some of the juice, and we can drink it, said I, feeling that I'd made a mistake in my cooking. So Nellie got a bowl, and I got a towel, and lifted the big saucepan carefully off. It was heavy and hot, and I was a little afraid of it, but didn't like to say so. Just as I began to pour, Debbie suddenly called from the top of the stairs, "'Children, what under the sun are you doing?' It startled us both. Nellie dropped the bowl and ran. I dropped the saucepan and didn't run, for a part of the hot juice splashed upon my bare feet feet and ankles, and made me scream with dreadful pain. Down rushed Debbie, to find me dancing about the kitchen with a great bump on my forehead, a big spoon in my hand, and a pair of bright purple feet. The plums were lying all over the hearth, the saucepan in the middle of the room, the basin was broken, and the sugar swimming about, as if the bowl had turned itself over, trying to sweeten our mess for us. Debbie was very good to me, 
for she never stopped to scold, but laid me down on the old sofa, and bound up my poor little feet with oil and cotton wool. Nellie, seeing me lie white and weak, thought I was dying, and went over to the neighbours for Aunt Betsy, and burst in upon the old ladies sitting primly at their tea, crying distractedly, Oh, Aunt Betsy, come quick, for the saucepan fell off the shed, and Fan's feet are all boiled purple. Nobody laughed at this funny message, and Aunt Betsy ran all the way home, with a muffin in her hand and her ball in her pocket, though the knitting was left behind. I suffered a great deal, but I wasn't sorry afterward for I learned to love Aunt Betsy, who nursed me tenderly, and seemed to forget her strict ways in her anxiety for me. This bag was made for my special comfort, and hung on the sofa where I lay all those weary days. Aunt kept it full of pretty patchwork, or, what I liked better, ginger nuts and peppermint drops, to amuse me, though she didn't approve of cosseting children up any more than I do now. I like that very well, and I wish I could have been there, was Maud's condescending remark as she put back the little bag after a careful peep inside, as if she hoped to find an ancient ginger nut or a well-preserved peppermint drop still lingering in some corner. We had plums enough that autumn, but didn't seem to care much about them after all, for our prank became a household joke, and for years we never saw the fruit, but Nellie would look at me with a funny face and whisper, Purple stockings, Fan. Thank you, ma'am, said Polly. Now, Fan, your turn next. Well, I've a bundle of old letters, and I'd like to know if there is any story about them, answered Fanny, hoping some romance might be forthcoming. Grandma turned over the little packet tied up with a faded pink ribbon, a dozen yellow notes written on rough, thick paper, with red wafers still adhering to the folds, showing plainly that they were written before the day of initial note paper and self-sealing envelopes. They are not love letters, dearie, but notes from my mates. After I left Miss Cotton's boarding school, I don't think there is any story about them and Grandma turned them over with spectacles before the dim eyes, so young and bright when they first read the very same notes. Fanny was about to say, I'll choose again, when Grandma began to laugh so heartily that the girls felt sure she had caught some merry old memory which would amuse them. Bless my heart! I haven't thought of that frolic these forty years. Poor dear giddy Sally Pomroy, and she's a great grandmother now, cried the old lady after reading one of the notes and clearing the mist off her glasses. Now please tell about her. I know it's something funny to make you laugh so, said Polly and Fan together. Well, it was droll, and I'm glad I remembered it, for it's just the story to tell you young things. It was years ago, began Grandma briskly, and teachers were very much stricter than they are now. The girls at Miss Cotton's were not allowed lights in their rooms after nine o'clock, never went out alone, and were expected to behave like models of propriety from morning to night. As you may imagine, ten young girls full of spirits and fun found these rules hard to keep, and made up for good behaviour in public by all sorts of frolics in private. Miss Cotton and her brother sat in the back parlour, after school was over, and the young ladies were sent to bed. Mr. John was very deaf, and Miss Priscilla very near-sighted. Two convenient afflictions for the girls on some occasions but once they proved quite the reverse, as you shall hear. We had been very prim for a week, and our bottled-up spirits could no longer be contained. So we planned a revel after our own hearts, 
and set our wits to work to execute it. The first obstacle was surmounted in this way. As none of us could get out alone, we resolved to lower Sally from the window, for she was light and small and very smart. With our combined pocket money, she was to buy nuts and candy, cake and fruit, pie and a candle, so that we might have a light after Betsy took ours away, as usual. We were to darken the window of the inner chamber, set a watch in the little entry, light up, and then for a good time. At eight o'clock on the appointed evening, several of us professed great weariness, and went to our room, leaving the rest sewing virtuously with Miss Cotton, who read Hannah Moore's sacred dramas aloud, in a way that fitted the listeners for bed as well as a dose of opium would have done. I am sorry to say that I was one of the ringleaders, and as soon as we got upstairs, produced the rope, provided for the purpose, and invited Sally to be lowered. It was an old-fashioned house, sloping down behind and the closet window chosen by us was not many feet from the ground. It was a summer evening, so that at eight o'clock it was still light, but we were not afraid of being seen, for the street was a lonely one, and our only neighbours, two old ladies, who put down their curtains at sunset and never looked out till morning. Sally had been bribed by promises of as many goodies as she could eat, and being a regular madcap, she was ready for anything. Tying the rope round her waist, she crept out, and we let her safely down, sent a big basket after her, and saw her slip round the corner in my big sunbonnet and another girl's shawl so that she should not be recognised. Then we put our nightgowns over our dresses, and were laid peacefully in bed when Betsy came up earlier than usual, for it was evident that Miss Cotton felt a little suspicious at our sudden weariness. For half an hour we lay laughing and whispering as we waited for the signal from Sally. At last, we heard a cricket chirp shrilly under the window, and flying up, saw a little figure below in the twilight. Oh, quick, quick, cried Sally, panting with haste. Draw up the basket, and then get me in, for I saw Mr. Cotton in the market, and ran all the way home, so that I might get in before he came. Up came the heavy basket, bumping and scraping on the way, and smelling oh so nice. Down went the rope, and with a long pull, a strong pull, and a pull all together, we hoisted poor Sally half way up to the window, when, sad to tell, the rope slipped, and down she fell only being saved from broken bones by the haycock under the window. He's coming, he's coming, oh, pull me up for mercy's sake, cried Sally, scrambling to her feet, unhurt, but a good deal shaken. We saw a dark figure approaching and dragged her in, with more bumping and scraping, and embraced her with rapture, for we had just escaped being detected by Mr. John, whose eyes were as sharp as his ears were dull. We heard the front door shut, then a murmur of voices, and then Betsy's heavy step coming upstairs. Under the bed went the basket, and into the beds went the conspirators, and nothing could have been more decorous than the appearance of the room when Betsy popped her head in. Master's an old fidget to send me travelling up again, 
just because he fancied he saw something amiss at the window. Nothing but a curtain flapping or a shadder, for the poor dears is sleeping like lambs. We heard her say this to herself, and a general titter agitated the white coverlets as she departed. Sally was in a high feather at the success of her exploit, and danced about like an elf, as she put her nightgown on over her frock, braided her hair in funny little tails all over her head, and fastened the great red pin-cushion on her bosom for a breast-pin in honour of the feast. The other girls went to their rooms as agreed upon, and all was soon dark and still upstairs, while Miss Cotton began to enjoy herself below, as she always did when her young charges were safely disposed of. Then ghosts began to walk, and the mice scuttled back to their holes in alarm, for white figures glided from room to room, till all were assembled in the little chamber. The watch was set at the entry door, the signal agreed upon, the candle lighted, and the feast spread forth upon a newspaper on the bed with the coverlet arranged so that it could be whisked over the refreshments at a moment's notice. How good everything was, to be sure! I don't think I've eaten any pies since that had such a delicious flavour as those broken ones eaten hastily in that little oven of a room with Sally making jokes, and the others enjoying stolen sweets with true girlish relish. Of course, it was very wicked, but I must tell the truth. We were just beginning on the cake, when the loud scratching of a rat disturbed us. The signal! Fly! Run! Hide! Hush! don't laugh cried several voices and we scuttled into bed as rapidly and noiselessly as possible with our mouths and hands full a long pause broken by more scratching but as no one came we decided on sending to inquire what it meant i went and found mary the picket guard half asleep, and longing for her share of the feast. It was a real rat. I've not made a sound. Do go and finish. I'm tired of this, said Mary, slapping away at the mosquitoes. Back I hurried with the good news. Everyone flew up briskly. We lighted the candle again and returned to our revel. The refreshments were somewhat injured by Sally's bouncing in among them, but we didn't care, and soon finished the cake. Now let's have the nuts, I said, groping for the paper bag. They are almonds and peanuts, so we can crack them with our teeth. Be sure you get the bag by the right end, said Sally. I know what I'm about, and to show her that it was all right, I gave the bag a little shake when out flew the nuts, rattling like a hailstorm all over the uncarpeted floor. Now you've done it, cried Sally, as Mary scratched like a mad rat, and a door creaked below, for Miss Cotton was not deaf such a flurry as we were in. Out went the candle, and each one rushed away with as much of the feast as she could seize in her haste. Sally dived into her bed, recklessly demolishing the last pie, and scattering the candy far and wide. Poor Mary was nearly caught, 
for Miss Cotton was quicker than Betsy, and our guard had to run for her life. Our room was the first, and was in good order, though the two flushed faces on the pillows were rather suspicious. Miss Cotton stood staring about her, looking so funny without her cap, that my bedfellow would have gone off in a fit of laughter if I had not pinched her warningly. Young ladies, what is this unseemly noise? No answer from us, but a faint snore. Miss Cotton marched into the next room, put the same question, and received the same reply. In the third chamber lay Sally, and we trembled as the old lady went in. Sitting up, we peeped and listened breathlessly. Sarah, I command you to tell me what all this means. But Sally only sighed in her sleep, and muttered wickedly, Ma, take me home, I'm starved at Cotton's. Mercy on me, is the child going to have a fever? cried the old lady, who did not observe the tell-tale nuts at her feet. So dull, so strict, oh, take me home moaned Sally, tossing her arms and gurgling like a naughty little gypsy. That last bit of acting upset the whole concern, for as she tossed her arms, she showed the big red cushion at her breast. Near-sighted as she was, that ridiculous object could not escape Miss Cotton. Neither did the orange that rolled out from the pillow, nor the boots appearing at the foot of the bed. With sudden energy, the old lady plucked off the cover, and there lay Sally with her hair dressed, la topsy, her absurd breastpin, and her dusty boots, among papers of candy, bits of pie and cake oranges and apples and a candle upside down burning a hole in the sheet at the sound of miss cotton's horrified exclamation sally woke up and began laughing so merrily that none of us could resist following her example and the rooms rang with merriment for many minutes I really don't know when we should have stopped, if Sally had not got choked with the nut she had in her mouth, and so frightened us nearly out of our wits. What became of the things, and how were you punished? asked Fan, in the middle of her laughter. The remains of the feast went to the pig, and we were kept on bread and water for three days. Did that cure you? Oh, dear, no. We had half a dozen other frolics that very summer, and, although I cannot help laughing at the remembrance of this, you must not think, child, that I approve of such conduct, or excuse it. No, no, my dear, far from it. I call that a tip-top story. Drive on, Grandma, and tell one about boys broke in a new voice, and there was Tom astride of a chair, listening and laughing with all his might, for his book had come to an end, and he had joined the party unobserved. Wait for your turn, Tommy. Now, Polly dear, what will you have? said Grandma, looking so lively and happy that it was very evident reminiscing did her good. Let mine come last, and tell one for Tom next said Polly, looking round and beckoning him nearer. He came and sat himself cross-legged on the floor before the lower drawer of the cabinet, which Grandma opened for him, saying, with a benign stroke of the curly head, There, dear, that's where I keep the little memorials of my brother Jack. Poor lad, he was lost at sea, you know. Well, choose anything you like and I'll try to remember a story about it. Tom made a rapid rummage and fished up a little broken pistol. 
There, that's the chat for me. Wish it wasn't spoilt. Then we'd have fun popping away at the cats in the yard. Now then, Grandma. I remember one of Jack's pranks when that was used with great effect said grandma after a thoughtful pause during which tom teased the girls by snapping the lock of the pistol in their faces once upon a time continued madam much flattered by the row of interested faces before her my father went away on business leaving mother aunt and us girls to jack's care very proud he was to be sure of the responsibility and the first thing he did was to load that pistol and keep it by his bed in our great worriment for we feared he'd kill himself with it for a week all went well then we were startled by the news that robbers were about all sorts of stories flew through the town we were living in the country then some said that certain houses were marked with a black cross and those were always robbed others that there was a boy in the gang for windows so small that they were considered safe were entered by some little rogue at one place the thieves had a supper and left ham and cake in the front yard mrs jones found mrs smith's shawl in her orchard with a hammer and an unknown teapot near it one man reported that someone tapped at his window in the night saying softly is anyone here and when he looked out two men were seen to run down the road we lived just out of town in a lonely place the house was old with convenient little back windows and five outside doors jack was the only man about the place and he was barely thirteen mother and aunt were very timid and the children weren't old enough to be of any use so jack and i were the home guard and vowed to defend the family manfully good for you hope the fellows came cried tom charmed with this opening one day an ill-looking man came in and asked for food continued grandma with a mysterious nod and while he ate i saw him glance sharply about from the wooden buttons on the back doors to the silver urn and tankards on the dining-room sideboard a strong suspicion took possession of me and i watched him as a cat does a mouse he came to examine the premises i'm sure of it but we will be ready for him i said fiercely as i told the family about him this fancy haunted us all and our preparations were very funny mother borrowed a rattle and kept it under her pillow aunt took a big bell to bed with her and the children had little jip the terrier to sleep in their room while jack and i mounted guard he with the pistol and i with the hatchet for i didn't like firearms biddy who slept in the attic practised getting out on the shed roof so that she might run away at the first alarm every night we arranged pitfalls for the robbers and all filed up to bed bearing plate money weapons and things to barricade with as if we lived in war times we waited a week and no one came so we began to feel rather slighted for other people got a scare as tom says and after all our preparations we really felt a trifle disappointed that we had no chance to show our courage 
at last a black mark was found upon our door and a great panic ensued for we felt that now our time had come that night we put a tub of water at the bottom of the back stairs and a pile of tin pans at the top of the front stairs so that any attempt to come up would produce a splash or a rattle bells were hung on door handles sticks of wood piled up in dark corners for robbers to fall over and the family retired all armed and all provided with lamps and matches jack and i left our doors open and kept asking one another if we didn't hear something till he fell asleep i was wakeful and lay listening to the crickets till the clock struck twelve then i got drowsy and was just dropping off when the sound of steps outside woke me up staring wide awake creeping to the window i was in time to see by dim moonlight a shadow glide around the corner and disappear a queer little thrill went over me but i resolved to keep quiet till i was sure something was wrong for i had given so many false alarms i didn't want jack to laugh at me again popping my head out the door i listened and presently heard a scraping sound near the shed there they are but i won't rouse the house till the bell rings or the pans fall the rogues can't go far without a clatter of some sort and if we could only catch one of them we should get the reward and a deal of glory i said to myself grasping my hatchet firmly a door closed below and a step came creeping towards the back stairs sure now of my prey i was just about to scream jack when something went splash into the tub at the foot of the back stairs in a minute every one was awake and up for jack fired his pistol before he was half out of bed and roared fire so loud it roused the house mother sprung her rattle aunt rang her bell jip barked like mad and we all screamed while from below came up a regular irish howl some one brought a lamp and we peeped anxiously down to see our own stupid biddy sitting in the tub wringing her hands and wailing dismally oh murther and it's kilt i am the saints be about us however did i come fornest this say if wather just crepin in quiet after a bit of stroll wid mike mahoney me own be that's to marry me entirely come st patrick's day next we laughed so we could hardly fish the poor thing up or listen while she explained that she had slipped out of her window for a word with mike and found it fastened when she wanted to come back so she had sat on the roof trying to discover the cause of this mysterious barring out till she was tired when she prowled round the house till she found a cellar window unfastened after all our care and got in quite cleverly she thought but the tub was a new arrangement which she knew nothing about and when she fell into the say she was bewildered and could only howl this was not all the damage either for aunt fainted with the fright mother cut her hand with a broken lamp the children took cold hopping about on the wet stairs jip barked himself sick i sprained my ankle and jack not only smashed a looking-glass with his bullets 
but spoilt his pistol by the heavy charge put in it after the damages were repaired and the flurry was well over jack confessed that he had marked the door for fun and shut biddy out as a punishment for gallivanting of which he didn't approve such a rogue as that boy was but didn't the robbers ever come cried tom enjoying the joke but feeling defrauded of the fight never my dear but we had our scare and tested our courage and that was a great satisfaction of course answered grandma placidly well i think you were the bravest of the lot i'd like to have seen you flourishing round there with your hatchet added tom admiringly and the old lady looked as much pleased with the compliment as if she had been a girl i choose this said polly holding up a long white kid glove shrunken and yellow with time but looking as if it had a history ah that now has a story worth telling cried grandma adding proudly treat that old glove respectfully my children for lafayette's honoured hand has touched it oh grandma did you wear it did you see him do tell us all about it and that will be the best of the whole cried polly who loved history and knew a good deal about the gallant frenchman and his brave life grandma loved to tell this story and always assumed her most imposing air to do honour to her theme drawing herself up therefore she folded her hands and after two or three little hems began with an absent look as if her eyes beheld a far-away time which brightened as she gazed the first visit of lafayette was before my time of course but i heard so much about it from my grandfather that i really felt as if i'd seen it all our aunt hancock lived in the governor's house on beacon hill at that time here the old lady bridled up still more for she was very proud of our aunt ah uh, my dears those were the good old times she continued with a sigh ah such dinners and tea-parties such damask tablecloths and fine plates such solid handsome furniture and elegant carriages aunt's was lined with red silk velvet and when the coach was taken away from her at the governor's death she just ripped out the lining and we girls had spencers made of it dear heart how well i remember playing in aunt's great garden and chasing jack up and down those winding stairs and my blessed father in his plum-coloured coat and knee-buckles and the queue i used to tie up for him every day handing aunt in to dinner looking so dignified and splendid grandma seemed to forget her story for a minute and become a little girl again among the playmates dead and gone so many years polly motioned the others to be quiet and no one spoke till the old lady with a long sigh came back to the present and went on well as i was saying the governor wanted to give a breakfast to the french officers and madam who was a hospitable soul got up a splendid one for them but by some mistake or accident it was discovered at the last minute that there was no milk a great deal was needed and very little could be bought or borrowed so despair fell upon the cooks and maids and the great breakfast would have been a failure if madam with the presence of mind of her sex had not suddenly bethought herself of the cows feeding on the common to be sure they belonged to her neighbours and there was no time to ask leave but it was a national affair 
our allies must be fed and feeling sure that her patriotic friends would gladly lay their cows on the altar of their country madame hancock covered herself with glory by calmly issuing the command milk them it was done to the great astonishment of the cows and the entire satisfaction of the guests among whom was lafayette this milking feat was such a good joke that no one seems to have remembered much about the great man though one of his officers a count signalized himself by getting very tipsy and going to bed with his boots and spurs on which caused the destruction of aunt's best yellow damask coverlet for the restless sleeper kicked it into rags by morning aunt valued it very much even in its tattered condition and kept it a long while as a memorial of her distinguished guests the time when i saw lafayette was in eighteen twenty five and there were no tipsy counts then uncle hancock a sweet man my dears though some call him mean nowadays was dead and aunt had married captain scott it was not at all the thing for her to do however that's neither here nor there she was living in federal street at the time a most aristocratic street then children and we lived close by old josiah quincy was mayor of the city and he sent aunt word that the marquis lafayette wished to pay his respects to her of course she was delighted and we all flew about to make ready for him aunt was an old lady but she made a grand toilette and was as anxious to look well as any girl what did she wear asked fan with interest she wore a steel-coloured satin trimmed with black lace and on her cap was pinned a lafayette badge of white satin i shall never forget how beautifully she looked as she sat in state on the front parlour sophy right under a great portrait of her first husband and on either side of her sat madame stora and madame williams elegant to behold in their stiff silks rich lace and stately turbans we don't see such splendid old ladies nowadays i think we do sometimes said polly slyly grandma shook her head but it pleased her very much to be admired for she had been a beauty in her day we girls had dressed the house with flowers old mr coolidge sent in a clothes basket full joe joy provided the badges and aunt got out some of the revolutionary wine from the old beacon street cellar i wore my green and white palmarine my hair bowed high the beautiful leg of mutton sleeves that were so becoming and these very gloves well by and by the general escorted by the mayor drove up dear me i see him now a little old man in nankeen trousers and vest a long blue coat and ruffled shirt leaning on his cane for he was lame and smiling and bowing like a true frenchman as he approached the three old ladies rose and curtsied with the utmost dignity lafayette bowed first to the governor's picture then to the governor's widow and kissed her hand that was droll for on the back of her glove was stamped lafayette's likeness and the gallant old gentleman kissed his own face then some of the young ladies were presented 
and as if to escape any further self salutations the marquis kissed the pretty girls on the cheek yes my dears here is just the spot where the dear old man saluted me i'm quite as proud of it now as i was then for he was a brave good man and helped us in our trouble he did not stay long but we were very merry drinking his health receiving his compliments and enjoying the honour he did us down in the street there was a crowd of course and when he left they wanted to take out the horses and drag him home in triumph but he didn't wish it and while that affair was being arranged we girls had been pelting him with the flowers which we tore from the vases the walls and our own topknots to scatter over him he liked that and laughed and waved his hand to us while we ran and pelted and begged him to come again we young folks quite lost our heads that night and i haven't a very clear idea of how i got home the last thing i remember was a hanging out of the window with a flock of girls watching the carriage roll away while the crowd cheered as if they were mad bless my heart it seems as if i heard em now hurrah for lafayette and mayor quincy hurrah for madame hancock and the pretty girls hurrah for colonel may three cheers for boston now then hurrah 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 and here the old lady stopped out of breath with her cap askew her spectacles on the end of her nose and her knitting much the worse for being waved enthusiastically in the air while she hung over the arm of her chair shrilly cheering an imaginary lafayette the girls clapped their hands and tom hurrahed with all his might saying when he got his breath lafayette was a regular old trump i always liked him my dear what a disrespectful way to speak of that great man said grandma shocked at young america's irreverence well he was a trump anyway so why not call him one asked tom feeling that the objectionable word was all that could be desired what queer gloves you wore then interrupted fanny who had been trying on the much-honoured glove and finding it a tight fit much better and cheaper than we have now returned grandma ready to defend the good old times against every insinuation you are an extravagant set nowadays and i really don't know what you are coming to by the way i've got somewhere two letters written by two young ladies one in fifteen seventeen and the other in eighteen sixty eight the contrast between the two will amuse you i think after a little search grandma produced an old portfolio and selecting the papers read the following letter written by anne boleyn before her marriage to henry the eighth and now in the possession of a celebrated antiquarian dear mary i have been in town almost a month and yet i cannot say i have found anything in london extremely agreeable we rise so late in the morning seldom before six o'clock and sit up so late at night being scarcely in bed before ten that i am quite sick of it and was it not for the abundance of fine things i am every day getting i should be impatient of returning into the country my indulgent mother bought me yesterday at a merchant's in cheapside three new shifts that cost fourteen pence an ell and i am to have a pair of new stuff shoes for my lord norfolk's ball which will be three shillings the irregular life i have led since my coming to this place has quite destroyed my appetite you know i could manage a pound of bacon and a tankard of good ale for my breakfast in the country but in london i find it difficult to get through half the quantity though i must own i am generally eager enough for the dinner hour which is here delayed till twelve in your polite society i played at hot cockles last night at my lord of leicester's the lord of surrey was there a very elegant young man who sung a song of his own composition on the lord of kildare's daughter 
it was much approved and my brother whispered me that the fair geraldine for so my lord of surrey calls his sweetheart is the finest woman of the age i should be glad to see her for i hear she is good as she is beautiful pray take care of the poultry during my absence poor things i always fed them myself and if marjorie has knitted me the crimson worsted mittens i should be glad if they were sent up at the first opportunity adieu dear mary i am just going to mass and you shall speedily have the prayers as you have now the kindest love of your own anne boleyn up before six and think it late to go to bed at ten what a countrified thing anne must have been bacon and ale for breakfast and dinner at twelve how very queer to live so cried fanny lord surrey and lord leicester sound fine but hot cockles and red mittens and shoes for three shillings are horrid i like it said polly thoughtfully and i'm glad poor anne had a little fun before her troubles began may i copy that letter some time grandma yes dear and welcome now here's the other by a modern girl on her first visit to london this will suit you better fan and grandma read what a friend had sent her as a pendant to anne's little picture of london life long ago my dearest constance after three months of intense excitement i snatch a leisure moment to tell you how much i enjoy my first visit to london having been educated abroad it really seems like coming to a strange city at first the smoke dirt and noise were very disagreeable but i soon got used to these things and now find all i see perfectly charming we plunged at once into a whirl of gaiety and i have had no time to think of anything but pleasure it is the height of the season and every hour is engaged either in going to balls concerts theatres fetes and church or in preparing for them we often go to two or three parties in an evening and seldom get home till morning so of course we don't rise till noon next day this leaves very little time for our drives shopping and calls before dinner at eight and then the evening gaieties begin again at a ball at lady russell's last night i saw the prince of wales and danced in the set with him he is growing stout and looks dissipated i was disappointed in him for neither in appearance nor conversation was he at all princely i was introduced to a very brilliant and delightful young gentleman from america i was charmed with him and rather surprised to learn that he wrote the poems which were so much admired last season also that he is the son of a rich tailor how odd these americans are with their money and talent and independence oh my dear i must not forget to tell you the great event of my first season i am to be presented at the next drawing-room think how absorbed i must be in preparation for this grand affair mamma is resolved that i shall do her credit and we have spent the last two weeks driving about from milliners to mantua makers from merchants to jewellers i am to wear white satin and plumes pearls and roses my dress will cost a hundred pounds or more and is very elegant my cousins and friends lavish lovely things upon me and you will open your unsophisticated eyes when i display my silks and laces trinkets and french hats not to mention billets d'eux photographs and other relics of a young belle's first season you ask if i ever think of home i really haven't time but i do sometimes long a little for the quiet the pure air and the girlish amusements i used to enjoy so much one gets pale and old and sadly fagged out with all this dissipation pleasant as it is i feel quite blah already if you could send me the rosy cheeks bright eyes and gay spirits i always had at home i'd thank you as you cannot do that please send me a bottle of june rainwater for my maid tells me it is better than any cosmetic for the complexion and mine is getting ruined by late hours i fancy some fruit off our own trees would suit me for i have no appetite and mamma is quite desolate about me one cannot live on french cookery without dyspepsia and one can get nothing simple here for food like everything else is regulated by the fashion adieu ma chere i must dress for church i only wish you could see my new hat and go with me for lord rockingham promised to be there adieu yours eternally florence yes i do like that better and i wish i had been in this girl's place don't you polly said fan as grandma took off her glasses i should love to go to london and have a good time but i don't think i should care about spending ever so much money or going to court maybe i might when i got there for i do like fun and splendor added honest polly feeling that pleasure was a very tempting thing grandma looks tired let's go and play in the drawing room said maud who found the conversation getting beyond her depth 
"'Let us all kiss and thank, Grandma, for amusing us so nicely before we go,' whispered Polly. Maud and Fanny agreed, and Grandma looked so gratified by their thanks that Tom followed suit, merely waiting till those girls were out of sight to give the old lady a hearty hug and a kiss on the very cheek Lafayette had saluted. When he reached the playroom, Polly was sitting in the swing, saying very earnestly, "'I always told you it was nice up in Grandma's room, and now you see it is. I wish you'd go oftener. She admires to have you, and likes to tell stories and do pleasant things. Only she thinks you don't care for her quiet sort of fun. I do, anyway, and I think she's the kindest, best old lady that ever lived, and I love her dearly.' I didn't say she wasn't, only old people are sort of tedious and fussy, so I keep out of their way, said Fanny. Well, you ought not to, and you miss lots of pleasant times. My mother says we ought to be kind and patient and respectful to all old folks just because they are old, and I always mean to be. Your mother's everlastingly preaching, muttered Fan, nettled by the consciousness of her own shortcomings with regard to Grandma. She don't preach cried polly firing up like a flash she only explains things to us and helps us be good and never scolds and i'd rather have her than any other mother in the world though she don't wear velvet cloaks and splendid bonnets so now go it polly called tom who was gracefully hanging head downward from the bar put up for his special benefit polly's mad polly's mad sung Maud, skipping rope round the room. If Mr. Sidney could see you now, he wouldn't think you such an angel any more, added Fanny, tossing a bean-bag and her head at the same time. Polly was mad, her face was very red, her eyes very bright, and her lips twitched, but she held her tongue and began to swing as hard as she could, fearing to say something she would be sorry for afterward. For a few minutes no one spoke. Tom whistled, and Maud hummed, but Fan and Polly were each soberly thinking of something, for they had reached an age when children, girls especially, begin to observe, contrast, and speculate upon the words, acts, manners, and looks of those about them. A good deal of thinking goes on in the heads of these shrewd little folks, and the elders should mind their ways, for they get criticized pretty sharply and imitated very closely. Two little things had happened that day, and the influence of a few words, a careless action, was still working in the active minds of the girls. Mr. Sidney had called, and while Fanny was talking with him she saw his eye rest on Polly, who sat apart watching the faces round her with the modest, intelligent look which many found so attractive. At that minute Madame Shaw came in, and stopped to speak to the little girl. Polly rose at once, and remained standing till the old lady passed on. "'Are you laughing at Polly's prim ways?' Fanny had asked, as she saw Mr. Sidney smile. "'No, I am admiring Miss Polly's fine manners.' he answered in a grave, respectful tone, which had impressed Fanny very much, for Mr. Sidney was considered by all the girls as a model of good breeding and that indescribable something which they called elegance. Fanny wished she had done that little thing and won that approving look, for she valued the young man's good opinion because it was so hard to win, by her set at least, so, when Polly talked about old people, it recalled this scene and made Fan cross. Polly was remembering how, when Mrs. Shaw came home that day in her fine visiting costume, and Maud ran to welcome her with unusual affection, she gathered up her lustrous silk and pushed the little girl away, saying impatiently, "'Don't touch me, child. Your hands are dirty.' Then the thought had come to Polly that the velvet cloak didn't cover a right motherly heart, that the fretful face under the nodding purple plumes was not a tender motherly face, and that the hands in the delicate primrose gloves had put away something very sweet and precious. She thought of another woman, whose dress never was too fine for little wet cheeks to lie against, or loving little arms to press whose face, 
in spite of many lines and the gray hairs above it was never sour or unsympathetic when children's eyes turned towards it and whose hands never were too busy too full or too nice to welcome and serve the little sons and daughters who freely brought their small hopes and fears sins and sorrows to her who dealt out justice and mercy with such wise love ah that's a mother thought polly as the memory came warm into her heart making her feel very rich and pity maud for being so poor this it was that caused such sudden indignation at fanny's dreadful speech and this it was that made quick-tempered polly try to calm her wrath before she used towards fanny's mother the disrespectful tone she so resented toward her own as the swing came down after some dozen quick journeys to and fro polly seemed to have found a smile somewhere up aloft for she looked toward fan saying pleasantly as she paused a little in her airy exercise i'm not mad now shall i come and toss with you no i'll come and swing with you answered fanny quick to feel the generous spirit of her friend you are an angel and i'll never be so rude again she added as polly's arm came round her and half the seat was gladly offered no i ain't but if i ever get it all like one it will be mother's preaching that did it <laughs> said polly with a happy laugh good for you polly peacemaker cried tom quoting his father and giving them a grand push as the most appropriate way of expressing his approbation of the sentiment nothing more was said but from that day there slowly crept into the family more respect for grandma more forbearance with her infirmities more interest in her little stories and many a pleasant gossip did the dear old lady enjoy with the children as they gathered round her fire solitary so long End of chapter six Chapter Seven of An Old Fashioned Girl. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. An Old Fashioned Girl by Louisa May Alcott. Chapter Seven. Goodbye. Oh dear, must you really go home Saturday? said Fan some days after what tom called the grand scrimmage i really must for i only came to stay a month and here i've been nearly six weeks answered polly feeling as if she had been absent a year make it two months and stay over christmas come do now urged tom heartily you are very kind but i wouldn't miss christmas at home for anything besides mother says they can't possibly do without me neither can we can't you tease your mother and make up your mind to stay began fan polly never teases she says it's selfish and i don't do it now much put in maud with a virtuous air don't you bother polly she'd rather go and i don't wonder let's be just as jolly as we can while she stays and finish up with your party fan said tom in a tone that settled the matter polly had expected to be very happy in getting ready for the party but when the time came she was disappointed for somehow that naughty thing called envy took possession of her and spoiled her pleasure before she left home she thought her new white muslin dress with its fresh blue ribbons the most elegant and proper costume she could have but now when she saw fanny's pink silk with a white tarlatan tunic and innumerable puffings bows and streamers her own simple little toilet lost all its charms in her eyes and looked very babyish and old-fashioned even maud was much better dressed than herself and looked very splendid in her cherry-colored and white suit with a sash so big she could hardly carry it and little white boots with red buttons they both had necklaces and bracelets earrings and brooches but polly had no ornament except the plain locket on a bit of blue velvet 
her sash was only a wide ribbon tied in a simple bow and nothing but a blue snood in the pretty curls her only comfort was the knowledge that the modest tucker drawn up round the plump shoulders was real lace and that her bronze boots cost nine dollars poor polly with all her efforts to be contented and not to mind looking unlike other people found it hard work to keep her face bright and her voice happy that night no one dreamed what was going on under the muslin frock till grandma's wise old eyes spied out the little shadow on polly's spirits and guessed the cause of it when dressed the three girls went up to show themselves to the elders who were in grandma's room where tom was being helped into an agonizingly stiff collar maud pranced like a small peacock and fan made a splendid courtesy as every one turned to survey them but polly stood still and her eyes went from face to face with an anxious wistful air which seemed to say i know i'm not right but i hope i don't look very bad grandma read the look in a minute and when fanny said with a satisfied smile how do we look she answered drawing polly toward her so kindly very like the fashion plates you got the patterns of your dresses from but this little costume suits me best do you really think i look nice and polly's face brightened for she valued the old lady's opinion very much yes my dear you look just as i like to see a child of your age look what particularly pleases me is that you have kept your promise to your mother and haven't let any one persuade you to wear borrowed finery young things like you don't need any ornaments but those you wear tonight youth health intelligence and modesty as she spoke grandma gave a tender kiss that made polly glow like a rose and for a minute she forgot that there were such things as pink silk and coral earrings in the world she only said thank you ma'am and heartily returned the kiss but the words did her good and her plain dress looked charming all of a sudden polly's so pretty it don't matter what she wears observed tom surveying her over his collar with an air of calm approval she hasn't got any boutelles to her dress and i have said maud settling her ruffled bands over her shoulders which looked like cherry-colored wings on a stout little cherub i did wish she'd just wear my blue set ribbon is so very plain but as tom says it don't much matter and fanny gave an effective touch to the blue bow above polly's left temple she might wear flowers they always suit young girls said mrs shaw privately thinking that her own daughters looked much the best yet conscious that blooming polly had the most attractive face bless me i forgot my posies in admiring the bells hand them out tom and mr shaw nodded toward an interesting-looking box that stood on the table seizing them wrong side up tom produced three little bouquets all different in color size and construction why papa how very kind of you cried fanny who had not dared to receive even a geranium leaf since the late scrape your father used to be a very gallant young gentleman once upon a time said mrs shaw with a simper ah tom it's a good sign when you find time to think of giving pleasure to your little girls and grandma patted her son's bald head as if he wasn't more than eighteen thomas jr had given a somewhat scornful sniff at first but when grandma praised his father the young man thought better of the matter and regarded the flowers with more respect as he asked which is for which guess said mr shaw pleased that his unusual demonstration had produced such an effect 
the largest was a regular hothouse bouquet of tea rosebuds scentless heath and smilax the second was just a handful of sweet peas and mignonette with a few cheerful pansies and one fragrant little rose in the middle the third a small posy of scarlet verbenas white feverfew and green leaves not hard to guess the smart one for fan the sweet one for polly and the gay one for pug now then catch hold girls and tom proceeded to deliver the nosegays with as much grace as could be expected from a youth in a new suit of clothes and very tight boots that finishes you off just right and is a very pretty attention of papa's now run down for the bell has rung and remember not to dance too often fan be as quiet as you can tom and maud don't eat too much supper grandma will attend to things for my poor nerves won't allow me to come down with that mrs shaw dismissed them and the four descended to receive the first batch of visitors several little girls who had been asked for the express purpose of keeping maud out of her sister's way tom had likewise been propitiated by being allowed to bring his three bosom friends who went by the schoolboy names of rumple sherry and spider they will do to make up sets this gentlemen are scarce and the party is for polly so i must have some young folks on her account said fanny when sending out her invitations of course the boys came early and stood about in corners looking as if they had more arms and legs than they knew what to do with tom did his best to be a good host but ceremony oppressed his spirits and he was forced to struggle manfully with the wild desire to propose a game of leap-frog for the long drawing-rooms cleared for dancing tempted him sorely polly sat where she was told and suffered bashful agonies as fan introduced very fine young ladies and very stiff young gentlemen who all said about the same civil things and then appeared to forget all about her when the first dance was called fanny cornered tom who had been dodging her for he knew what she wanted and said in an earnest whisper now tom you must dance this with polly you are the young gentleman of the house and it's only proper that you should ask your company first polly don't care for manners i hate dancing don't know how let go of my jacket and don't bother or i'll cut away altogether growled tom daunted by the awful prospect of opening the ball with polly i'll never forgive you if you do come be clever and help me there's a dear you know we both were dreadfully rude to polly and agreed that we'd be as kind and civil to her as ever we could i shall keep my word and see that she isn't slighted at my party for i want her to love me and go home feeling all right this artful speech made an impression on the rebellious thomas who glanced at polly's happy face remembered his promise and with a groan resolved to do his duty <sighs> well i'll take her but i shall come to grief for i don't know anything about your old dances yes you do i've taught you the steps a dozen times i'm going to begin with a redow because the girls like it and it's better fun than square dances now put on your gloves and go and ask polly like a gentleman oh thunder muttered tom and having split the detested gloves in dragging them on he nerved himself for the effort walked up to polly made a stiff bow stuck out his elbow and said solemnly may i have the pleasure miss melton he did it as much like the big fellows as he could and expected that polly would be impressed but she wasn't a bit for after a surprised look she laughed in his face and took him by the hand saying heartily of course you may but don't be a goose tommy well fan told me to be elegant so i tried to whispered tom adding as he clutched his partner with a somewhat desperate air hold on tight and we'll get through somehow the music struck up and away they went tom hopping one way and polly the other in a most ungraceful manner keep time to the music gasped polly can't never could returned tom keep step with me then and don't tread on my toes pleaded polly never mind keep bobbing and we'll come right by and by muttered tom giving his unfortunate partner a sudden whisk which nearly landed both on the floor 
but they did not get right by and by for tom in his frantic efforts to do his duty nearly annihilated poor polly he tramped he bobbed he skated he twirled her to the right dragged her to the left backed her up against people and furniture trod on her feet rumpled her dress and made a spectacle of himself generally polly was much disturbed but as every one else was flying about also she bore it as long as she could knowing that tom had made a martyr of himself and feeling grateful to him for the sacrifice oh do stop now this is dreadful cried polly breathlessly after a few wild turns isn't it said tom wiping his red face with such an air of intense relief that polly had not the heart to scold him but said thank you and dropped into a chair exhausted i know i made a guy of myself but fan insisted on it for fear you'd be offended if i didn't go the first dance with you said tom remorsefully watching polly as she settled the bow of her crushed sash which tom had used as a sort of handle by which to turn and twist her i can do the lancers tip-top but you won't ever want to dance with me any more he added as he began to fan her so violently that her hair flew about as if in a gale of wind yes i will i'd like to and you shall put your name down here on the sticks of my fan that's the way trick says when you don't have a ball book looking much gratified tom produced the stump of a lead pencil and wrote his name with a flourish saying as he gave it back now i'm going to get sherry or some of the fellows that do the redoubt well so you can have a real good go before the music stops off went tom but before he could catch any eligible partner polly was provided with the best dancer in the room mr sidney had seen and heard the whole thing and though he had laughed quietly he liked honest tom and good-natured polly all the better for their simplicity polly's foot was keeping time to the lively music and her eyes were fixed wistfully on the smoothly gliding couples before her when mr sidney came to her saying in the pleasant yet respectful way she liked so much miss polly can you give me a turn oh yes i'm dying for another and polly jumped up with both hands out and such a grateful face that mr sidney resolved she should have as many turns as she liked this time all went well and tom returning from an unsuccessful search was amazed to behold polly circling gracefully about the room guided by a most accomplished partner ah that's something like he thought as he watched the bronze boots retreating and advancing in perfect time to the music don't see how sidney does the steering so well but it must be fun and by jupiter i'll learn it added shaw jr with an emphatic gesture which burst the last button off his gloves polly enjoyed herself till the music stopped and before she had time to thank mr sidney as warmly as she wished tom came up to say with his most lordly air you dance splendidly polly now you just show me any one you like the looks of and i'll get him for you no matter who he is i don't want any of the gentlemen they are so stiff and don't care to dance with me but i like those boys over there and i'll dance with any of them if they are willing said polly after a survey i'll trot out the whole lot and tom gladly brought up his friends who all admired polly immensely and were proud to be chosen instead of the big fellows there was no sitting still for polly after that for the lads kept her going at a great pace and she was so happy she never saw or suspected how many little manoeuvres heart-burnings displays of vanity affectation and nonsense were going on all round her she loved dancing and entered into the gaiety of the scene with a heartiness that was pleasant to see her eyes shone her face glowed her lips smiled and the brown curls waved in the air as she danced with a heart as light as her feet are you enjoying yourself polly asked mr shaw who looked in now and then to report to grandma that all was going well oh such a splendid time cried polly 
with an enthusiastic little gesture as she chassayed into the corner where he stood she is a regular belle among the boys said fanny as she promenaded by they are so kind in asking me and i am not afraid of them explained polly prancing simply because she couldn't keep still so you are afraid of the young gentleman hey and mr shaw held her by one curl all but mr sidney he don't put on airs and talk nonsense and oh he does dance like an angel as trix says papa i wish you'd come and waltz with me fan told me not to go near her cause my wet dress makes her pink one look ugly and tom won't and i want to dreadfully i've forgotten how maudie ask polly she'll spin you round like a teetotum mr sidney's name is down for that answered polly looking at her fan with a pretty little air of importance but i guess he wouldn't mind my taking poor maud instead she hasn't danced hardly any and i've had more than my share would it be very improper to change my mind and polly looked up at her tall partner with eyes which plainly showed that the change was a sacrifice not a bit give the little dear a good waltz and we will look on answered mr sidney with a nod and smile that is a refreshing little piece of nature said mr shaw as polly and maud whirled away she will make a charming little woman if she isn't spoiled no danger of that she has got a sensible mother i thought so and sidney sighed for he had lately lost his own good mother when supper was announced polly happened to be talking or trying to talk to one of the pokey gentlemen whom fan had introduced he took miss milton down of course put her in a corner and having served her to a dab of ice and one macaroon he devoted himself to his own supper with such interest that polly would have fared badly if tom had not come and rescued her i've been looking everywhere for you come with me and don't sit starving here said tom with a scornful look from her empty plate to that of her recreant escort which was piled with good things following her guide polly was taken to the big china closet opening from the dining-room to the kitchen and here she found a jovial little party feasting at ease maud and her bosom friend Grace were seated on tin cake boxes sherry and spider adorned the refrigerator while tom and rumpel foraged for the party here's fun said polly as she was received with a clash of spoons and a waving of napkins you just perch on that cracker keg and i'll see that you get enough said tom putting a dumb waiter before her and issuing his orders with a fine air of authority we are a band of robbers in our cave and i am the captain and we pitch into the folks passing by and go out and bring home plunder now rumple you go and carry off a basket of cake and i'll watch here till katie comes by with a fresh lot of oysters polly must have some sherry cut into the kitchen and bring a cup of coffee spider scrape up the salad and poke the dish through the slide for more eat away polly and my men will be back with supplies in a jiffy such fun as they had in that closet such daring robberies of jelly pots and cake boxes such successful raids into the dining-room and kitchen such base assaults upon poor katie and the colored waiter who did his best but was helpless in the hands of the robber horde a very harmless little revel for no wine was allowed and the gallant band were so busy skirmishing to supply the ladies that they had not time to eat too much no one missed them and when they emerged the feast was over except for a few voracious young gentlemen who still lingered among the ruins that's the way they always do poke the girls in corners give em just one taste of something and then go out and stuff like pigs whispered tom with a superior air forgetting certain private banquets of his own after company had departed the rest of the evening was to be devoted to the german and as polly knew nothing about it she established herself in a window recess to watch the mysteries for a time she enjoyed it for it was all new to her and the various pretty devices were very charming 
but by and by that bitter weed envy cropped up again and she could not feel happy to be left out in the cold while the other girls were getting gay tissue paper suits droll bonbons flowers ribbons and all manner of tasteful trifles in which girlish souls delight every one was absorbed mr sidney was dancing tom and his friends were discussing baseball on the stairs and maud's set had returned to the library to play polly tried to conquer the bad feeling but it worried her till she remembered something her mother once said to her when you feel out of sorts try to make someone else happy and you will soon be so yourself i will try it thought polly and looked round to see what she could do sounds of strife in the library led her to enter maud and the young ladies were sitting on the sofa talking about each other's clothes as they had seen their mammas do was your dress imported asked grace no was yours returned blanche yes and it cost oh ever so much i don't think it was as pretty as maud's mine was made in new york said miss shaw smoothing her skirts complacently i can't dress much now you know cause mamma's in black for somebody observed miss alice lovett feeling the importance which affliction conferred upon her when it took the form of a jet necklace well i don't care if my dress isn't imported my cousin had three kinds of wines at her party so now said blanche did she and all the little girls looked deeply impressed till maud observed with a funny imitation of her father's manner my papa said it was scandalous for some of the little boys got tipsy and had to be tooked home he wouldn't let us have any wine and grandma said it was very improper for children to do so my mother says your mother's coo isn't half so stylish as ours put in alice yes it is too it's all lined with green silk and that's nicer than old wet cloth cried maud ruffling up like an insulted chicken well my brother don't wear a horrid old cap and he's got nice hair i wouldn't have a brother like tom he's horrid rude my sister says retorted alice he isn't your brother was a pig you're a fib so are you here i regret to say miss shaw slapped miss lovett who promptly returned the compliment and both began to cry polly who had paused to listen to the edifying chat parted the belligerents and finding the poor things tired cross and sleepy yet unable to go home till sent for proposed to play games the young ladies consented and puss in the corner proved a peacemaker presently in came the boys and being exiles from the german gladly joined in the games which soon were lively enough to wake the sleepiest blind man's buff was in full swing when mr shaw peeped in and seeing polly flying about with bandaged eyes joined in the fun to puzzle her he got caught directly and great merriment was caused by polly's bewilderment for she couldn't guess who he was till she felt the bald spot on his head this frolic put every one in such spirits that polly forgot her trouble and the little girls kissed each other good night as affectionately as if such things as imported frocks coots and rival brothers didn't exist well polly do you like parties asked fan when the last guest was gone very much but i don't think it would be good for me to go to many answered polly slowly why not i shouldn't enjoy them if i didn't have a fine dress and dance all the time and be admired and all the rest of it i didn't know you cared for such things cried fanny surprised neither did i till to-night but i do and as I can't have em, it's lucky I'm going home tomorrow. Oh, dear, so you are. What shall I do without my sweet pea, as Sidney calls you? sighed Fanny, bearing Polly away to be cuddled. 
every one echoed the exclamation next day and many loving eyes followed the little figure in the drab frock as it went quietly about doing for the last time the small services which would help to make its absence keenly felt polly was to go directly after an early dinner and having packed her trunk all but one tray she was told to go and take a run while grandma finished polly suspected that some pleasant surprise was going to be put in for fan didn't offer to go with her maud kept dodging about with something under her apron and tom had just whisked into his mother's room in a mysterious manner so polly took the hint and went away rejoicing in the thought of the unknown treasures she was to carry home mr shaw had not said he should come home so early but polly thought he might and went to meet him mr shaw didn't expect to see polly for he had left her very busy and now a light snow was falling but as he turned into the mall there was the round hat and under it the bright face looking all the rosier for being powdered with snowflakes as polly came running to meet him there won't be any one to help the old gentleman safely home to-morrow he said as polly took his hand in both hers with an affectionate squeeze yes there will see if there isn't cried polly nodding and smiling for fan had confided to her that she meant to try it after her friend had gone i'm glad of it but my dear i want you to promise that you will come and make us a visit every winter a good long one said mr shaw patting the blue mittens folded round his hand if they can spare me from home i'd love to come dearly they must lend you for a little while because you do us all good and we need you do i i don't see how but i'm glad to hear you say so cried polly much touched i can't tell you how exactly but you brought something into my house that makes it warmer and pleasanter and won't quite vanish i hope when you go away my child polly had never heard mr shaw speak like that before and didn't know what to say she felt so proud and happy at this proof of the truth of her mother's words when she said that even a little girl could exert an influence and do some good in this big busy world she only gave her friend a grateful look sweeter than any words and they went on together hand in hand through the soft falling snow if polly could have seen what went into that top tray she would have been entirely overcome for fanny had told grandma about the poor little presents she had once laughed at and they had all laid their heads together to provide something really fine and appropriate for every member of the milton family such a mine of riches and so much goodwill affection and kindly forethought was packed away in the tempting bundles that no one could feel offended but would find an unusual charm about the pretty gifts that made them doubly welcome i only know that if polly had suspected that a little watch was ticking away in a little case with her name on it inside that trunk she never could have left it locked as grandma advised or have eaten her dinner so quietly as it was her heart was very full and the tears rose to her eyes more than once every one was so kind and so sorry to have her go tom didn't need any urging to play escort now and both fan and maud insisted on going too mrs shaw forgot her nerves and put up some gingerbread with her own hands mr shaw kissed polly as if she had been his dearest daughter and grandma held her close whispering in a tremulous tone my little comfort come again soon while katie waved her apron from the nursery window crying as they drove away the saints bless ye miss polly dear and send ye the best of lucks but the crowning joke of all was tom's good-bye for when polly was fairly settled in the car the last all aboard 
uttered, and the train in motion, Tom suddenly produced a knobby little bundle, and thrusting it in at the window, while he hung on in some breakneck fashion, said, with a droll mixture of fun and feeling in his face, "'It's horrid, but you wanted it, so I put it in to make you laugh. Goodbye, Polly. Goodbye. Goodbye.' The last adieu was a trifle husky, and Tom vanished as it was uttered, leaving Polly to laugh over his parting souvenir till the tears ran down her cheeks. It was a paper bag of peanuts, and poked down at the very bottom a photograph of Tom. It was horrid, for he looked as if taken by a flash of lightning, so black, wild, and staring was it, but Polly liked it and whenever she felt a little pensive at parting with her friends, she took a peanut or a peep at Tom's funny picture, which made her merry again. So the short journey came blithely to an end, and in the twilight she saw a group of loving faces at the door of a humble little house, which was more beautiful than any palace in her eyes, for it was home. End of chapter 7